celebrate Christmas and the birth of Jesus uh, coming to the world, and it is a wonderful uh, time, and I just love what they just did for us, the beautiful songs, but I, I come, I mean, coming for your soul in this sermon today, y'all. I, I hope that you didn't come for a nice, cute 15-minute sermon, and hope you can go home into your ham. Come on, somebody, come on. The ham gonna have to wait today, come on. I am coming for you today, y'all, come on. Uh, Esther chapter 9, Esther chapter 9, you know I mean business where I wear a suit and tie, the enemy better run fast, (laughs) y'all. Ain't that right, Elder Roger? Come on, somebody. Oh, man. So, uh, here we go. Uh, uh, (laughs) Man, you threw me off right there, brother. (laughs) Uh, Esther chapter 9, let's read Esther chapter 9 and see what God has to say to us today. It says this. Uh, on the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the edict, uh, the edict commanded by the king was carried was to be carried out. On this day, the enemy of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, overpower them, but now the tables were reversed, and the Jews got the upper hand uh, to, to those who hated them. I, I want to read to you another portion of scripture. Um, is found in the, the 20th verse of that same chapter. The Bible says this, Mordecai recorded these events, and he sent letters to all the Jews and throughout the provinces of the king Xerxes, near and far, to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar. It says, as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month when their sorrows were turned into joy, And their mourning turned into a day of celebration. He wrote them to observe these days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. Let's pray. Father, I pray for the next few moments that you may bypass the distractions of the holiday seasons and bypass the my limited wisdom to speak right to your people. Father, in this moment, I decrease so that you may increase in this moment. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. So we've been in the book of Esther for the last uh, few months, and we have gone. In fact, uh, today is the capstone of the book of Esther. It is the final uh, chapters that we're going to be looking at, verses uh, chapters 9 and 10. Uh, of the book of Esther, we have heard a lot of things in this book, but one of the, the main themes of the book of Esther is the providence of God. I just pray that you never forget that. I pray uh, in my spirit that you don't forget that your God is in control. And sometimes I know how life looks, and life looks like God is not in control, and it looks like God is, uh, is, be, is moving on to someone else's life. And sometimes it feels like God is blessing everybody else but your life. It, it, it can appear that God is active more in one person's life than he is in your life. But I just come to remind you of this one truth uh, that the book of James talks about. The Bible says in the book of James that your God is no respecter of persons, meaning this, that the activity that he had in Moses' life is the same activity that he has in your life. The activity that he had in the Apostle Paul's life is the same activity that he wants to have in your life. In fact, your God loves you and he's always moving. And we've learned in this book of Esther that the name of God is not mentioned at all. We don't see the name of God. It's the only book of the Bible that the name of God is not mentioned. And I believe this, that this name is not mentioned, is because I think God wanted us to know that although you don't see his name, and although you don't hear God being declared, it does not mean that your God is not working and moving in your life. There may be times where you don't see God and you don't feel God, but you have to trust that God is moving and God is doing a great work in your life today. So this is the book of Esther. So we're in chapter 9. We ended off our last week in chapter 7 and 8. And we ended off by, uh, it was a great moment. It was awesome. Because like in that moment was uh, Haman, in the enemy of the Jews, was about to kill Mordecai. 
and he was about to execute all the Jews. And in the midnight hour, the, the, the Lord woke up the king and began to want, to want to honor Mordecai. And as a result, they ended up killing Haman, the enemy of the Jews. Now, chapter 9 starts, and I thought that if I was God and I was writing the book of Esther, I would have, you know, you know just uh, made this way more dramatic than how this starts off in chapter 9. Chapter 9 starts off by saying that, hey, on the, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the, the, the day had come. You know, you know, in chapter 2 when the decree had came that the Jews were about to uh, die and lose their lives, the people of God was about to be eliminated because of Haman's evil uh, heart towards the people of God. And that day had come. This is the day. And I thought that the climax of the book had already been done. I thought that the war was over, but still, after God uh, sovereignly uh, went on the king's heart and to, to make sure that the, the Jews would not die, he told the, Jew, the Jews, you're still going to have to fight the war. I'm going to give you the weapons. I'm going to give you the power and the ability to defend yourselves, but you're still going to have to fight for this thing. And I think about that, and I thought about that for a while. And it just, if I was me, if it was me, I would have just canceled the war. If I was the king, I would have said, no, no, there's no war. That You guys are going to be alive and you're safe. Queen Esther is amazing. I love her. I found fa there's favor that I see in her. And if I was a king, I would have just canceled the war. But the king gave them victory, but still made them fight the war. And I thought about that. I thought about that for our lives because the miracles that God has with your name on it and, and the victories that God has for your family, they're still, they're declared to you, but you still are going to have to fight for this thing. Like in this kingdom, sometimes in, in dramatic church environments, it, it may appear that your God just moves and you just stand still and the miracles of God is just going to pop up in, out of nowhere. Can I tell you the victory and the miracles of God over your life, you're going to have to fight for them. God wants to have a victory over your marriage, you're going to have to fight for it. God wants to have a victory over your businesses, but you got to fight for it. you got to learn how to fight for the miracles that's already been declared to you. So the Bible goes on and says in chapter 9, they begin to fight this war. And the Bible says this, out of nowhere, the tables were turned. It was a reversal that happened. And they began to fight this war. And the people that was fighting against the Jews, they were so afraid of them. And the Bible says that they killed 500 people on one day. In fact, they also killed the sons of Haman. Haman, who being the enemy of God, who had died the, the night prior uh, because of his hatred towards the people of God. And now the kids of Israel says, hey, let's not only just kill Haman, but let's kill off the, offs the offsprings that, that may come back in our life and be our enemy again. And I love it that the Bible says this, that they not only they killed the sons, but they, they put the sons on high stakes, 75 feet in the air, so that they can be reminded of what their God had delivered them from. And I thought that was interesting. I thought that that was really uh, just confusing to me. They looked kind of very uh, um, just bloody, that why would the people of God put their dead bodies of their enemies high up in the air for the world to, to see? And I believe this, that the enemy had to be put up high up so that they can be reminded of what their God had brought them from. You know, sometimes that we got to remind ourselves of what our God has brought us from. We got to remind us of the, the life that we used to have. Because if you forget about your testimony, it's the moment where the enemy can come back into your life and begin to enslave you again. So you got to constantly remind yourself of what he brought you from as a testimony unto your God. I like what the Bible says in Revelations. It says this, that we not only overcome by the blood of the Lamb, but by the word of your testimony. It is your testimony that's going to get you through some things. Come on. It's your testimony. It is your story that's going to get you through the darkest nights of your life. And the people of God had to put up their enemies high up so that they can be reminded to themselves of what their God had brought them from. 
We see when David, when he slain Goliath, he didn't just leave their body, the body there. No, no, no. He took the head and he cut it off and he brought it as a trophy to the people of God to remind them that every Goliath in your life will be slain by the power of your God. You got to learn how to take the things of your past and use them as a testimony to help you move forward in this life. So they took the, the bodies of these sons and they hung them up high. And I just want to remind you today, please never, ever don't forget your testimony. Don't forget where God has brought you from. Because the moment you forget your testimony is the moment you lose the power to move forward into your destiny today. And so please don't forget your testimony. But later on in verse 20 is what I really want to get to today. They end up winning the war. The sons of Haman is all hung, and, and they really killed the enemy. They killed the offsprings, and I believe that that's a, a, what we need to do in our own lives. There's an enemy in our lives that we need to make sure that it's just dead, dead, you know. And uh, in verse 20, it says this, Mordecai recorded these events, all the events. And he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the providence of King Xerxes, near and far. He told them uh, to have them celebrate every year this story of Esther. In fact, it became a feast that, that the Jewish people will have every single year. And still to this day, those who are not Messianic Jews, they still celebrate the, the, the Feast of Purim. And it is the, the feast in where they all out loud read the book of Esther. And they remind themselves still to this day. Now, this is interesting. Because nowhere else in the Old Testament do we see the people of God rehearsing once a year. We didn't, tell, we didn't see God tell them to rehearse the book of Judges. Although God delivered the people in the book of Judges with a lot of things. Samson and Deborah. We, 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 we didn't see them to rehearse the stories of King David. And although those were great stories. We didn't see a God tell them to rehearse Haggai and all the prophets and Jeremiah, Isaiah. No, no, no. This is the only book in the Old Testament where the people of God are commanded to read out loud every single year. So I begin to ask myself, why does God want us to remember the book of Esther every year? And my first point is this is that I believe this, that God wants us to remember the book of Esther because he wants us to remember that the ending of your story is not up for discussion. I just want to let you know that the ending of your story is not up for discussion. Here in the text, this is not, this is a weird ending of a story because if I was writing the book of Esther, I would have made it more like a Rocky versus the Russian type moment. You know what I'm saying? Rocky gets into the ring, and, and, and the people of God begins this war against them. And literally, they fight, and they fight, and, and they're losing the war. And in the middle of the night, God comes riding on a white horse, really with a unicorn horse out of the middle of the night, and saves the day. No, that's not how it happens. It, it, it simply says, on the 13th day of the 12th month of the month of Adar, that the, the day was here, and on that day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but the tables were reversed, and the Jews got the upper hand, end of the story, the, the war won. How anticlimactic. <laughs> how, how just, you know, and, and you think about the book of Esther. The book of Esther is a book of drama, ups and downs. Queen Esther elevated. Then right after that, Haman comes in and has this uh, command to kill all the Jews. This is a up and down book, a dramatic book. It's really interesting that the middle of the story is dramatic, but the ending of the story is firm and secure. And I just want to let you know that the book of Esther is your story. And although we don't know the middle of our lives and the middle of our story, we don't know what diagnoses are coming. We don't know what pain is coming. We don't know what hardships are coming. But what I can tell you what's coming is the ending of your story. And it's a story that you will win and you will walk in the promises of God. You will be who God's called you to be. Your family will be blessed. Your kids will be blessed. You will walk in the victory of God today. So I can't tell you what the middle of the story is, but I can tell you how it's going to end. The ending is this. You will walk in the promise of God. You will win. 
notice that they just quickly says, oh, yeah, they won. And I love how Mordecai, a few chapters prior, when he had that one-on-one -on -one moment with Esther, and he told Esther that this is the time, and the time is now, and you were created for such a time as this. And he told Esther this. He said, Esther, it's either you deliver us, and if you don't deliver us, God will make a way out of no way. He pretty much said, hey, we already know how this is going to end. It's up to you how the middle is going to happen. Come on, somebody. I want to let you know today that we already know how it's going to end. It's up to you how you allow the middle to happen. Come on, somebody. You got to make sure that your God is with you in the middle. I love it that Jesus didn't die at the end. He didn't die in the beginning. In fact, the Bible says that there was a thief and, and there were people that were surrounding him and he was in the middle of the crosses. There were three people that was crucified that day and Jesus was in the middle because God wanted to remind you that we know the ending of the story, but your Savior is with you in the middle. Your story, your God is with you in the dark. Your God is with you. Jesus died in the middle so that he can let you know that he will rescue you and you will survive your middle. Your middle won't be the end of your story. You might be in a bad chapter right now, but you're just in the middle. Your business may just be getting started and it's not taking off, but it's just the middle. Your marriage may be in a hardship right now, but it's just the middle. You may have walked through all painful situations and divorces and, 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 and hurt and hard times, but that's just the middle. That's not the ending of your story. God is not done writing your story. We know the end of your story. Your story is that you're going to win. Come on, somebody say it's just the middle. It's just the middle. So a, many, a few years ago, there was a, um, a, a really amazing Super Bowl um, it was between the New England Patriots and the Atlanta Falcons. And, uh, I mean, the, the New England Patriots were favored. Vegas had the odds pretty incredibly in their favor. And so Vegas knew who was going to win. In fact, they said, hey, we dare y'all to bet on Atlanta. And in the first half, the whole world was shocked. Because, I mean, the Atlanta Falcons came out of the gates on fire. In fact, on the, during the first half, the Atlanta Falcons had 21 points, and the, uh, the New England Patriots had a whopping three points. And it was a domination. And Vegas was freaking out. And Vegas was like, oh, my goodness, we betted on the wrong people. It's crazy. We thought we knew how it was going to end, and we were wrong. <laughs> and so during a the halftime, there's an article on this. There was an assistant coach. He told his positions that he coaches, he says this, hey, we're going to make adjustments, and your job is to get back on the field and allow the results to take care of themselves. And so they got back on the field, and it was an incredible comeback. It was a comeback of, of history that we've never seen in a Super Bowl before. And at the last second, the, the, the New England Patriots came back, and they won the game. It's really interesting that Vegas knew how it was going to end, but they got us scared in the middle of the game. And, and literally all the Patriots had to do was to get back on the field. And I'm telling you, the odds are in your favor. I believe this, the Vegas that's up in heaven has the odds in your favor. Because the Vegas up in heaven knows who's walking with you and who's fighting for you. And they've already given you the victory. You just got to get back on the field. You got to get back during a halftime and remind yourself, although you are down and although Though it's dark, your God just says, get back on the field because I've already favored you to win your life. Come on, that's a word, y'all. Come on. You're just in the middle. So they literally had to read this book every year to remind themselves of them just knowing that the ending of their story is not up for discussion. I believe the second thing, the reason why they had to read this book every year is that they had to read the book of Esther out loud every year because they had to remind themselves that their God is in control. We got to constantly remind ourselves that God is in control. Uh, if, if, I don't know about you, but I feel like sometimes I could do a better job at being God than God. I don't know about you, but I feel that like, well, maybe I'm, I'm the only unspiritual person in here. But sometimes I'm like, God, 
Like, I'm telling you, God, if you give me $5 million, I promise you I would bless people with one million of it. <laughs> I promise you. I promise you I'll invite people to my beach house. I promise you I'll fly people in my, God, just give it to me, God. And sometimes, like, I feel like I can do a better job at being God than God with my life. Like, I, I tell God all the time, God, why, why did you do that? Like, why did you allow that to happen? Like, and I'm like, God, you're not doing a good job with my life sometimes. I really believe that. Like, I feel like if I was God, I would not have allowed me to grow up in a single-parent home. I would have had a dad who really was there and really poured into my life and took me to the football games. I feel like if I was God, I would not have allowed my wife to be diagnosed with bipolar. I feel like if I was God, my wife would not have went through the childhood that she went through. I feel like if I was God, we would not have go through the issues that we went through. I feel like if I was God, our first year of marriage, we won't be struggling financially to, to eat food and to make ends meet. I feel like if I was God and I was in control of my life, things would be a lot better. But you got to convince yourself and remind yourself that everything that you're walking through is a part of a plan of a God that you don't know the full plan. You got to remind yourself that God is in control and needs to be in control of your life. In fact, he knows every moment. He knows why every pain that happened in your life, every dark night that happened in your life, and you got to remind yourself constantly that God is in control because when you allow God to be in complete control of your life, you now are able to walk in the victory of God. I think our biggest problem is that we don't want to give God complete control. So we can have toxic relationships because we tell God, God, you don't know about relationships like I do, God. God, you don't know how to choose men like I do, God. God, you don't know how I feel. You don't know that the feelings that I have, God. Although you gave me this biological body and my feelings, you don't know how I'm feeling, God. So I'm going to be in this toxic relationship because, God, you just don't know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, God, you want my, my money? God, you don't know how hard it is down here, God. I know you walked this earth and went on the cross, but you don't know about the struggle, God. God, you don't know about oodles and noodles, although you made the wheat to make the oodles and noodles. God, you don't know about my life. Can I tell you, your God knows about your life. Your God knows your limitations. In fact, he walked this earth, and that's why he was born into this earth on this Christmas Sunday to remind you that everything that you're feeling, he's already felt it, y'all. So let God be in control of your life. Allow him to be in complete control of your time. Let him run your schedule. Let him run, let him run your calendar. Let, let, let him run your life, your giftings. It's time for you to allow God to take control of your life. You don't decide when you serve and when you, 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 you use your giftings. It's so funny all the time. I have people all the time, like I come, you know, I ask them, hey, when are you going to start serving and, and using your gifts for God? I'll I do it when I'm ready. <laughs> no, 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 you do it when God says so. <laughs> oh, I serve when it feels good. No, 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 you serve because God tells you to serve. Oh, I, I'll give whenever it's convenient for me. No, no, no. You give when God says you to give. Like, it's time for you to allow God to be in control. And the people of God had to remind themselves of this all the time when they read this book once a year. Not only that their God is telling them that their ending is not up for discussion and that their God is in complete control and he needs to be in control. But my last point is this. I think it's time for us to know that we need to read the book of Esther once a year because we got to remember that our God is a God of reversals. Our God is a God of reversals. Can you put that first scripture on the screen for me? And I just want to read this. This, this is awesome. It says, on the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the edict, which is the command, the order commanded by the king was to be carried out. It's like, oh, this is the day. Oh, this is the day that the big war is about to happen. The fight is about to happen. And, and, and they were outnumbered. They were outnumbered by lots. They were about to lose this war. Although they were declared victors, but they had to fight this war, and they were about to lose it. I'm sure they were afraid. They were scared. 
And it says, on this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them. But now the tables were reversed. I like what the NIV's version says. The, the, the tables were turned. It, it's, it's a new day because your God has the power to reverse every dark situation of your life and turn it into light. That's who your God is. You serve a God who can reverse something. He can reverse it. So about two months ago, I met with a guy with the leadership of the city of Richmond. We were doing this program. It's called RCLI. It's a program where you kind of learn about the, 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 the movers and shakers of the city of Richmond, people behind the scenes uh, who controls a lot of the stuff that happens in the city. And they were doing a testimony time, and this one guy came up. His name was Elbrar Muhammad. And uh, in 1999, he was convicted of, of murdering uh, uh, three ladies, and he was sentenced to 120 years in a state prison. He always assumed, he always maintained his innocence, but he just, they, they convicted him, and he went through appeal after appeal after appeal after appeal. And so literally, he said that he was, you know, this 19, this is, I mean, he's been in there for almost over 20 years. And, and something happened out of nowhere. He said that he, he ran out of the pills. He had no more pills. And he had accepted that he was going to live the rest of his natural life inside of a state penitentiary. And something happened. Something happened with, like, the, the, one, one of the, the witnesses that came out and said, hey, by the way, we were coerced. And we lied about this guy. He was not even there. We didn't even see him that night. And literally, literally the guy, he was giving a testimony to all the business leaders of, the, of, of this area, of the city of Richmond. And he was giving this testimony of, he said that literally in the middle of the night, a guard comes and says, sir, you have court in the, mo in the morning. And he had no idea. He was like, oh, maybe he's been falsely accused for something else. And the judge He's in like, this is like a, he's on a TV. He's not in an actual courtroom. This is during COVID. So he's actually on a TV. And the judge looked into the monitor with tears in her eyes. She says, Mr. Muhammad, I come right now to reverse your sentence. I come right now to declare that you are innocent and you are now free to walk in freedom and out of this prison. And I just come to let you know right now, that is exactly what the book of Esther is declaring over your life right now. That although you may be in prison, although addiction may be there, although pain may be there, I come to declare that the sentence that's over your life is now reversed. Come on somebody, you serve a God who wants to reverse the curse over your life today. All right, all right, so here's what happened. So this is the book that they read every year. And it's really interesting, <laughs> really, really interesting. So when they read the book of Esther every year, this was a big feast, they had a big feast, they had food, it was joy, it was amazing. And so what happens is that they had to remind themselves of these truths that, that the ending is not up for discussion, that the God's in control, and they serve a God of reversals. So here's what happens. So 18 days prior to Jesus rising from the grave after he dies, 18 days prior to that was the feast of Purim. And the disciples and all those who follow God, they had a big feast. And they read out loud the book of Esther. And I believe this, on 15 days after they had that feast, I believe this, what happens is that, is that the disciples, they forgot. They forgot about the book of Esther. They forgot that they serve a God of reversals. And so in their head, the death was final. But I believe that there were some ladies, and specifically Mary, and Mary, she remembered 
wait, 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 wait. 18 days ago, we just read this. That on this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but now the tables were reversed and the Jews got the upper hand. In the middle of the night, she's like, oh, because this is like Jesus has been dead for a few days now. And I, she, it just came to her head. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but now the tables are reversed. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but now the tables are reversed. She said, what are they? We serve a God of reversal. So here's what happens. So she just books to the tomb. We serve a God of reversals. And when she got there, the tomb that had a dead body in there was empty. Come on, somebody. Because God had did the greatest reversal of all time. He turns death into life. All right, here we go, here we go. So the reason why Jesus had to reverse death into life is so that now he has the power and now he has the authority to reverse every situation that you're walking through, every dark night that comes your way, every diagnosis, every depression, every anxiety, every pain that comes your way. You have a God now that has the power and the authority to reverse everything that the enemy has thrown your way. Come on, somebody. No weapon that's formed against you shall be able to prosper what the enemy meant for evil. Your God is going to reverse it for the good. Come on, stand to your feet. Let's give God some praise that he is a God of reversals today.